About 10 years ago, at the birth of computer graphics, mathematicians started seeing extraordinary pictures appearing on their computer screens. Pictures such as this one, with all of this intricate detail. Or pictures such as this one, which also shows remarkable detail and complication. My name is John Hubbard. I'm a mathematician, and today I intend to tell you where these pictures come from and what they mean. I first ran into such pictures about 10 years ago when I was teaching elementary calculus at the University of Paris. 10 years ago there were computers, but there weren't very many and they were not available to undergraduate students. There were programmable calculators, however, and I cast around for a while to find programs that were sufficiently simple that one could in fact program them on a programmable calculator and at the same time which led to interesting results. The most obvious candidate was Newton's method, an algorithm designed by Newton, therefore very old, and I thought at that time well understood. I will now explain to you, in the old-fashioned way, with paper and pencil, like Newton would have done, what it is that Newton's method does. Newton's method concerns solving equations, trying to find numbers x such that f of x is equal to zero. Graphically, this means the following. The function f has some graph that might look something like this. And the solutions of f of x equals 0 are the places where the graph intersects the axis. Solving equations is something that everyone studies in school. More specifically, what they study is the solution of the quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And everyone knows the famous quadratic formula, x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. You might think that if you want to solve some other equation, such, for instance, as sine of x plus one-half x plus one-tenth is equal to zero, for instance, that what you need is to develop an analogous formula appropriate to this equation. Unfortunately, that will not work. There are no formulas in general to solve equations. It is not quite true that the quadratic formula is the beginning and the end of formulas for solving equations, but it's almost true, and certainly the quadratic formula is the only one of any real use. In general, when you want to solve an equation, what you really mean is that you want to approximate a root. You want to find sequences which get closer and closer. Newton's method is one such scheme. You start with what you think is an approximate root, say, this number. Call it x naught. Well, of course, it isn't a root. But if you replace the function by its linear approximation, the function whose graph is the line tangent to the graph of the original function, and look at the root of that, you find a new point x1, which you might think is perhaps a better guess at a root of the equation. If you continue this way, starting at x1 this time, you are led to another approximation, x2, which actually at the level of this drawing looks as if it's perfect. But in any case, you could continue, continue this procedure, and it is clear from the drawing that you will converge, and converge extremely rapidly to this root. That, of course, depended on having a good first guess a good point x naught to start with. If you had started with a different point x naught, say this point here, y naught, then the process might have been quite different. This linear approximation goes over to this point, which would then be y1. If you continue the process, Well, it certainly looks as if you're converging very nicely to a root. But you're not converging very nicely to the same root. 
Supposing I had st started with some third initial condition, such as, say, this one, Z0. Then the same sort of process might lead to that route, way over there on the far left. Of course, if these three initial conditions lead to these three routes, then other ones in between will necessarily lead to some points which just can't make up their minds and never go to any roots at all. Therefore, it seems quite likely that when there are many roots to the equation, Newton's method will be quite difficult to understand. In 1886, almost exactly a hundred years ago, a mathematician called Cayley published in the very first issue of the American Journal of Mathematics, which was the very first issue of any journal about mathematics ever published in the United States, an article in which he completely analyzed Newton's method for quadratic equations. Of course, it isn't very reasonable to use Newton's method to solve a quadratic equation because we already know everything about solving it. Still, it's a case to study, and in the last lines of that paper, Cayley announced that in a paper soon to be published, he was going to give a corresponding analysis for cubic equations, although, as he said, the case appeared to present considerably greater difficulties. Well, it certainly did present greater difficulties, so much greater that that paper, soon to be published, never was published. And in fact, I think that only very recently did we ever discover what it was that was really occurring when you tried to solve a cubic by Newton's method. I will now show you some slides which illustrate what occurs in that case. Here you see illustrated Newton's method for the polynomial z cubed minus 1. This polynomial has three roots, one in the center of the red eye, one in the center of the green eye, and one in the center of the blue eye. If you start your seed in any green region, red region, or blue region, you will converge to the root corresponding to the same color. In this picture, you have a slightly different cubic polynomial. Again, there are three roots. Again, there's a red eye, a blue eye, and a green eye. This time, fortunately, we are allowed an extra color, yellow, for none of the above. In this picture, which corresponds to yet another polynomial, there is again a yellow region. This yellow region, however, is considerably more complicated than it was before and will come to be a friend of ours. I call it the Towers of St. Mark because of its symmetrical shape with a large central piece and symmetrical pieces getting smaller and smaller on all sides. We will come to see this picture many times in the course of the show. In this case, again, there is a yellow region of seeds which do not lead to any root. But this time, this yellow set has quite a different structure from before. We call it the rabbit, perhaps in honor of Playboy. The body has two ears. Each one of those ears has two ears on it. There are infinitely many copies of this shape repeated infinitely many times with this tremendously complicated structure around it. Newton's method is an iterative scheme. You choose some seed, seed x0, and then you set x1 is equal to f of x0, x2 is equal to f of x1, etc. Iterative schemes are very interesting. One problem with Newton's method is that it's rather a complicated one, even when the function that you are trying to find roots of is fairly simple. Although pictures of Newton's method were the first pictures that I ever saw that came out of iterati iterating functions, they were sufficiently complicated that I made no progress in understanding them until I studied simpler function. The simpler function that was chosen was iterating quadratic polynomials, setting f of x is equal to x squared plus c.
it's very important to realize that quadratic polynomials are the simplest functions that you could choose to iterate. Well, you could choose to iterate ax plus c. You could not have a square in there at all. But that le leads to something very simple and uninteresting. This is the next case. And it turns out to be quite complicated enough. Let's see a few instances of this. Let us first consider the case c equals 0, by far the simplest in this subject. And if I set, for instance, x0 is equal to 1 half, you then easily see that x1 is equal to 1 half squared, which is 1 quarter. And then x2 is equal to 1 quarter squared, which is 1 sixteenth. And then x3 is equal to 1 16 squared, which is 1 256. And so forth. The sequence is clearly tending to 0. If you started with x0 is equal to 2, then x1 is equal to 2 squared is 4, x2 is equal to 16, and so forth. The sequence is clearly tending to infinity. These aren't the only two possibilities. If you started with x0 equals 1, then x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 1. The sequence is just constantly 1. 1 is a fixed point of the transformation f of x equals x squared. If you started with x0 equals minus 1, then x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 1, and so forth. All, after one move, the sequence becomes constantly 1. Actually, I am not going to want to consider, consider this iteration only in real numbers. I'm going to want to study it in complex numbers. Why? Well, there are at least two reasons. The first one, and a very good one, is that it leads to much more interesting and much prettier pictures. A picture in the line, well, a picture in the line can never be all that fascinating. But a picture in the plane, that's quite a different matter. There is another and deeper reason, although it is not obvious. You might think that iterating in real numbers would obviously be simpler than iterating in the complex numbers. But it is not so. In fact, it is easier to study iteration in complex numbers than in real numbers. And this is true in the precise sense that many results which people wanted to prove about iteration in real numbers never were proved until complex methods were introduced. Let us see what corresponds to such sequences if we study complex numbers. Well, under the mapping z gives z squared, it's fairly easy to see what happens. All the points inside the closed unit disk under iteration converge to 0, and all the points outside the closed unit disk converge to infinity. Of points on the boundary of the unit disk, the behavior can be very much more complicated. We saw what happens at 1 and at minus 1. We saw that in these examples. What happens, for instance, at the number i? Well, i maps to i squared is equal to minus 1, which maps to minus 1 squared is equal to 1. So after two moves, it lands on 1. This brings up a very natural construction. The points inside the closed unit disk are the points whose orbits, the sequences such that if you start at such a point and consider the iterates, 